Hello all, this is Michael, and I am James. We are the brothers Mahoney. It is nice to dearly deet you. Seriously. My- <laughs> <laughs> that was not the best improvisation I've ever heard, but as you go. Today we are discussing the church on Ruby Road, which is the first fall story of the 15th Doctor, aired on Christmas, so December 25th, just earlier, about a week ago, written by Russell T. Davies. And it is, as uh, well, as I'm sure you know, the first Christmas special since Trice Upon a Time, which I think was back in 2017, but I might be off. 2017 sounds right to me. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a while. Naturally, through the Chibnall era, we got some like New Year's pastors and stuff, if you already, if you already call them pastors, but it's been the first Christmas pastor in a while, so that is nice. The plot, it's, again, sort of like the giggle, this plot. Isn't the easiest to boil down, but I think it's a lot easier than the gay girl, actually. A few things will be more difficult, but a long ago on Christmas Eve, a baby was abandoned in the snow. Today, Ruby Sunday meets the doctor, stolen babies, goblins, and perhaps the secret of her birth. And just to make it clear, that baby abandoned in the snow long ago is Ruby Sunday today. Yeah, I thought it was actually a kind of atmospheric opening. Yeah, no, it certainly looks nice. And uh, Ruby Sunday naturally first appearance of this new companion. And as I said before, first false story with Shudi Gatwa. Ruby Sunday is played by Millie Gibson. To be honest, those are really the only two deeply important characters. There's also the, the mystery of Anita Dobson's character, who is a Mrs. Flood, which we'll touch on later. But I guess beforehand, we can talk about how this episode sort of sets up. You sort of see what Ruby Sunday is up to. She's trying to find out who her parents are. She was abandoned all that time ago. I, I, I forgive it gave an age. I'm assuming she was just... I think she's 19. Yeah. And I, I, Which I, is I, funny because I know the story is currently taking place in December 2023. So 19 would just be what? 2004? Yes. Which, t- technically speaking, should be just a year before the Ninth Doctor is meeting Rose. And just two years... After the Sabbath Doctor and Ace, that was a new Britannia party. Yeah, just to tie everything in. Yeah, things like this just fascinate me because when it comes to time travel, you get things like this all the time. It's very possible there was a story with a sixth Doctor and Maul or something that took place on modern day Earth in 2004, 2005. It's just all interesting because, technically speaking, in a cohesive universe, these things are kind of supposed to fit together. And just fun thing about what else is going on in the same time period, at least to me anyway. And it helps that the Doctor for some reason is attracted to the UK. Yeah, and it sort of focuses, the beginning it sort of focuses around what Ruby Sunday is up to. But we do see that the Doctor, it's not clear to me, it seems like he has an interest in Ruby Sunday early on. I'm not sure if he was necessarily following her, just trying to follow what seemed to be like random accidents happening. Well, I've seen a theory about that, actually, if you want me to share it. Yeah, by all means. I don't remember who said it. I like browsing Reddit after these episodes come out, see how people discuss them, what consensus is. That changes my mind, but just so I learn more about maybe things I missed, for example. But somebody made a suggestion that they might be trying to pull a, what was it called? The Fifth Doctor Story, um, Time of Angels. With that, with the Suti Gatwa, we see the 15th Doctor, we see it come up to her. It's the Doctor from later on in the season. Because it mentioned that he got over there really quickly. It was almost like teleportation. Which, the Doctor might have powerful gloves now, but he got, he's still to be able to teleport. So some people are suggesting, oh, maybe it's a Doctor from the future. Because we don't really know how the Doctor got interested with what was going on with Ruby and how he found out about any of it. Because we see Ruby have an interview with a actual real person who helps adopted children find their parents. Earlier, as one of the first scenes we see is an adult. And we see these accidents happening around her. But the doctor was there for that. And then a few weeks later, I think it was the 20th, maybe the 21st of the sample, the doctor, who has this amazing dance moves in this nightclub. I don't know if it's a nightclub exactly, but... It looked nightclub is. And he was wearing this coat and he was just having the time of his life out on the dance floor. This doctor has moves. But anyway, it's just changed the doctor somehow. Maybe it was just there and he just noticed her there. And he saw, I think she 
accidentally dropped the glass because um, Platris, the goblins, basically cause accidents. And it's laid even theorized maybe the goblins cause all accidents. And the doctor's not even sure if it's true or not. But it made him interested. <laughs> and maybe he just knows this from there on. But I don't know exactly how that all works. But I don't know. I thought that was an interesting theory. I don't think they would do it just because that was already done. But it's an interesting idea anyway. I can see the appeal. And it's true. We, we never do figure out exactly, at least in this, we never find out why the doctor has a interest or why he sort of runs into this whole issue. Once he saves the... Uh, the one woman who's walking with what looks like it would be her baby from like this falling. I, I don't even know what you call that. It's not really a statue. It's just a thing. Oh, the, the falling snowman. And fun fact, I noticed it. I didn't mention it at the time, but I did notice it. And I, I've since confirmed it online. But that's the same building Rose walked. Not, maybe not, it's the same building in the universe where Rose walked, but it's the same building It's where they filmed it. That was Henrik's, the department store that blew up. That's, that's, that's interesting. I could tell, even though it's winter, and of course, Rose did not take place in the winter, I could tell it was the same building because it looked exactly the same, even with a giant snowman there. It looked the same to me. So I thought that was really interesting that they used the same location. But I, I guess to talk about just the uh, doctor, we mentioned at the end of the giggle, or at some point in the giggle, that it seemed like Shudigatwa seems to have a very fun personality and i think this being his first uh, falls toy sort of conforms that he seems like an extraordinarily cheerful and fun loving guy i mean the scene when he's dancing he's just on the dance floor having a good time that, that was also i believe in like a, a preview to the episode but he seems like such a, a nice guy he's pretty much to everyone he runs across he's exceptionally polite too and it's not like most other doctors aren't polite to people they meet but sometimes Tan it can get like over focused on other things and he might not even notice someone talking to him Matt Smith just hated anyone above the age of five and then there's uh, naturally Capaldi uh, yeah and Capaldi just hated everybody it's part of his charm but this this doctor seems to legitimately enjoy people he, see, he just seems like a really nice guy he actually sort of does remind me a little bit of the fifth doctor only that was more I guess exuberant like a fifth doctor, sort of like a calm, collected heart. This guy, I mean, he's not like all over the place, but I, I just can't see Peter Davison doing that dancing. Like Peter Davison would enjoy a game of cricket, whereas this guy wants to be in the club dancing to these hot beats, bra. It's, yeah, it's just, so, it's so strange seeing the doctor in a club just enjoying his time. Yeah, he wasn't even as far as we as far as we know, he wasn't researching anything or trying to figure anything out or trying to stop any alien invasion. He was just on the dance floor. <laughs> that, that's it. So oh, one, one thing that's interesting is how long do you think this is after this regeneration? Because we are, as far as I know, we get no indication. Yeah, that's another thing. We have, no, we have absolutely no idea. So it could have, could have been like a 15-year gap. We don't, we don't know. Maybe yeah, they, they, this doctor's been the doctor now for 300 years. Fight me. Yeah, maybe Ruby Sanders is like his 18th companion. Yeah, and I mean, <laughs> it's exactly the type of thing that they can throw anything they want. Yeah, his, his companion beforehand was Ruby's mother, mother and that's how we'll find out. But. Actually, well, actually, that would have be well, oh, yeah. actually, be as bad as some things if I've heard suggested. But uh, and actually, we should have mentioned this before. But this is sort of the start, or sort of being heralded as the start of a new era of Doctor Who. Not naturally, this is a Christmas parcel. But apparently, they're going to be calling this upcoming season not season fourteen, but season one. Apparently, that's what I've heard. Which I mean, mentally, I'll just think of it as season fourteen. I'm, I'll just I forget mentally. I'll just call it season fourteen because that's what it is. Although, as the classic Who fans say, actually, I'll call it season 39 or whatever season it'll be. I, I, I don't go that far. I don't blame them. I'm not, I certainly don't hold it against them. But at the end of the day, it's still the same sort of sense of revival. So I see no reason to revamp the season, Ambreen. This isn't a Marvel comic book. Yeah, it, it just changed. But you, you can tell the show's trying something new. This episode had a... And to be fair, it's a Christmas pastor. Christmas pastors aren't always indicative of how the rest of the show will be. I think, uh, James, before we started recording, he mentioned earlier that a lot of Christmas pastors have tended to be more like lighter how the type things, generally speaking. I mean, of course, it's Christmas. Maybe you don't want anything that's really hardcore and intense. Although, to be fair, in my opinion, the David Tanner Christmas pastors were pretty... They weren't that much lighter or how did the normal ones. I believe the Christmas passes for Tana would have been the Christmas invasion, which of course was his first one, which we saw the Prime Minister commit basically a war crime when Harriet Jones shut down the Sycorax. 
the next one would have been the runaway bride. Maybe she's the doctor committed genocide, <laughs> basically, with the rockness. Then what would the next Christmas special have been? The next doctor or start Christmas? It's winter anyway. I can't remember if it was Christmas. Either way, that one was well, kind of it, more like... Would it Voyage of the Dawn be somewhere? Oh, I completely bypassed that. Yeah, see, that one was a bit more lighthearted, but at the same time... Pretty much felt like a normal episode. Yeah, it did not feel really any different from a normal Doctor Who episode. Uh, and I, that, I guess, uh, sorry, the Eve was a cop that listened, by the way. That was... Uh, yeah, I guess, to be fair, I mean, Trust Upon the Time was... I mean, it's sort of a parcel opposite because they brought back the character, the first Doctor. So, that, I mean, that wasn't too far moved either. But I think it's really much myth people think about when they think about these more silly Christmas passers. Well, it's like Return of Doctor Mysterio, which I, actually I'm not sure if that's even a Christmas parcel. It might just be a generic th- parcel. No, I think it was a Christmas parcel. Uh, it's the I, only I, episode that year. Yeah, I, I've only seen that once. I think, you, I think you've only seen it once too. I, I just can't remember with that much about it. But I remember it was on the more silly side, but I, I thought it was a lot of fun for my remember. Yeah, same, same here. And it, naturally, Matt Smith had things like a Christmas Carol. I, I don't remember a thing about Widow, Wardrobe, and the Duck. Yeah, but... that's the one people usually point to. I, I've i seen that a couple of times. I like it. It's okay. It's you know, it's not special, but I think it actually is surprisingly emotional near the end. It's not, it's not any doctor committing genocide, but it's, it's not a bad story. I guess the main point is it's not always easy or prudent to judge what a series is going to be just based on a Christmas parcel because it can run a gamut of different tones. This one had a... and You can tell just by watching the trailer, and not just the trailer, but there was a scene or two released before the episode came out that sort of showed, hey, this might not be your daddy's episode. I forget if there was more than one scene, but the scene naturally comes to mind is the Goblin song in which... Without context, we don't know what's going on. We see this baby going down a conveyor belt on this wooden ship with a bunch of goblins and this one lady goblin singing a song about how they're going to feast upon the flesh of the baby. And my wooden ship you mean it's literally floating in the sky. Yeah, it's, it's like a, a wooden sky pirate ship like thing. I mean, th- this episode. Yes, you do. Oh, indeed. This episode, and, and you, you, we knew this going in. Like, as soon as we hear like pirate goblin things. It, you, you, you can't help but think of like it feels like a very f- fantastical fantasy type stuff going on, as opposed to like, I guess, the whole more sciencey science fiction type stuff. Like, Wild Blue Yando and this feel completely different. Yeah, no, because Wild Blue Yando, which again, I really liked, I think I gave it a nine out of ten on IMDb anyway. Wild Blue Yando was straight sci fi, but there was the whole south of the arts of the universe or not south i mean it's kind of the south but the whole myth of the arts of the universe thing in finally enough set up in the episode that quote-unquote unleashed the toy maker and maybe and least the sword to go in a more fantasy direction for a bit inside of a straight cipher direction and of course they've always been kind of more fantasy things in the past there were the carrier knights who used what seemed like magic but it was just their own abilities that Tacni fit in some type of scientific understanding. And of course, there was Horns of Nime and had some fantasy elements. Actually, now that I think about it, a lot of the season had fantasy elements. It's worth mentioning, I, I think it's relevant. This is a famous quote by Arthur C. Clarke. By uh, any, yeah, that, that's a great quote. Uh, yeah. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I, I was just thinking about that quote. Anything. Like, the stuff in this, even though it feels fantasy, it was still the force enough science. It's still like yes, the doctor, as the doctor, I believe, science, is, it's just a different version of physics. Maybe not the voice the doctor's used to. And he did admit he's new to this, this type of thing. But there is still, it does fit within some type of realm that makes some sense. Yeah, so even though, I guess, from our perspective... It seems like it's a, a more fantasy episode. It's, I mean, technically, just from the perspective of the goblins, it's just another day on the wooden ship stealing babies. I suppose so. But it is interesting that they went the route. And one thing that people have pointed to is that, well, the Doctor didn't name or no one named the planet they were from. They just were goblins. And that's one thing people see. Um, it does feel more fantasy. And I'm fine with them going this route. I think it's an interesting route to explore. I wonder whether the story to become this powerful. But... 
I, th- I, th- I think it's an interesting route to explore. And I really do appreciate that if it is as connected to the myths that they are to the universe thing as it seems like it is, it would be that was great setup for this. It's the perfect time to play around like this. Although I would argue that it should last maybe a season or two. Then before we get another doctor, this doctor's again to more normal sci fi. Just so we can see that as well. But either way, it's an interesting route to take. Maybe not one I would have chosen, but it's an interesting route. When that video was released, just the uh, Goblin song, generally, no, I, I did it like scour the depths of reaction. I did like do a deep dive into what everyone is saying. But generally, the reaction I saw was pretty positive. It seemed like people would be liking that Goblin stuff. I, I just strongly saw a positive reaction to it. So when the episode came out and people were taking it back, because after the Goblin song is done, and this wasn't in the scene that was released, but in the full episode, shortly after the Goblin song, the Doctor and Ruby actually sing a bit too, which in context, well, out of context, you might be thinking, the fuck's going on in Doctor Who, bro? It's like Disney be throwing music everywhere. But in context, I think it makes sense. They're just trying to style for time. So you have to understand some ropes, bro. Uh, yeah, apparently the Goblin sip, it has no screws in it made out of ropes and ropes that are being tied in different ways to hold things together. Yeah, it's actually it, really fascinating. Yeah, it used to like fade in coincidence in ways that I didn't entirely understand, but I, I guess what's relevant, I, I saw some criticism, like this episode, some people really didn't care for it. And uh, th- specifically that scene with the dark tone Ruby singing, that turned some people off. And I, I get it. So I guess to put this in, in, in a wider lens, if you're like, uh, if you're out on Christmas at some pub watching Doctor Who in the bar and the singing, and you're like a big Doctor Who fan, I can see, because some people thought, oh, it was so cringe. And uh, like trying to, you know, bring a friend in to watch Doctor Who. And then that comes on and you're like, oh, I wish I didn't do that. I get that reaction, but it just seems a bit much to me. And to be fair, I watch this in the comfort of my home, expecting something. I mean, based on that Goblin song, what the fuck do you think was going to happen? Like, is the Doctor singing really that much out of the quest? It just seems like a strange, a strange hill to die on. But I, I don't know. I, I guess my thing is I actually enjoyed this episode seemingly more than, I guess, a lot of people. It's hard to say because some people really liked it. Some people didn't care for it much. Some people thought it was, as a kid, say, mid. But... I generally had a decent time with it. There's a few problems, but the, the whole thing with the Doctor and Ruby singing, I was I didn't have any issue with it. I think the episode I, I, I like the episode a bit more than I did upon first viewing. I think on first viewing I would have given it a five. Now I'm kind of in my weak older age and now I'll probably give it a six. It will now be a favorite of mine. I'm not sure it's going to ever be on par with things like Rose or the Eleventh Hour. Or even deep breath, which I have problems with. I mean, it's how to. It's I know it's very new, so it's how to think about it compared to other things like that. But I just see it having the same, I guess, ten factor at least of Rose. Uh, Rose had a lot of issues when it comes to the effects, but it was a hell of an introduction to an audience who didn't know who the Doctor was. Whereas this, especially they're trying to stick to the whole, oh, it's a new. It's a season one. I'm not sure this was nearly as effective in showing who the Doctor is. And not just effective showing who the Doctor is. I do think they did a great job with really introducing Ruby Sunday. There's been a decent conversation on this. I mean, the episode came out, what, like, like a week ago now? So this, so we're a bit late on this. We, she, I'm not sure she got much in the way of character. Like, it seems like her only character trait is she's willing to throw her life on the line to protect babies. And, and she's curious as to who her real parents were. And she's not great at improv. Hey, she she just went to Daily DU, but um she try I mean she's just thrown in like the doctor speaking of which doctor has a fantastic voice. I, I I have to say I don't know I don't know Shuti Gatwa. I I know he was I think in the show Sax Ad, which is I think Netflix. Of, I, I don't I, I've never seen it. I think he was in that show. I, I could be I could be entirely wrong. I, I I don't know the guy, but he has a really he dances well. And he has a really good voice. Like he has a really good singing. And he has a really good presence there too. I think the goblins are actually quite liking him. He did yeah. a nice little bow with the Goblin King. Very good flourish. Worked out really well for him. Plus, he called the Goblin King a great big thing. So 
<laughs> and be, being polite, but it's another thing. I, I don't mean to hop on this, but just an episode ago, we had the toy maker dancing along for like two minutes to the Spice Girls. A couple episodes before, we had the Masto dancing to Rao Rao Rasputin. So is it really that might much? Be only, like, might, 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 might be the only team we've seen that actually gave made me laugh in a gold way. Yeah, so is it out of the question that the doctor's singing? I, I just, again, just seems strange to me that that's something that bothered, I don't, I don't just say so many people, but it, it just seems strange to me. I saw that as often as I did, but yeah, I don't think they did a particularly great job introducing Ruby. Like, I feel like I don't know that much about her. And I, so I've got, even in a few scenes, I got Claire vibes and I'm not a big fan of Clara. In, insofar as like modern day companions should probably... I'm, tr- I'm trying to do some quick math here, and I'm not going to do it. I'm going to say she's in the bottom half, but it's sort of hard for me to visualize it without knowing all the companions. But I- I- I'm not a big Clara fan. And I was getting some Clara vibes from Ruby Sunday, which I-, I hope in the next couple of episodes disappear. Yeah, it will help once we see more of her and see what she's about. I, I don't really love the fact that the really big thing to start her up is just the mystery of who her mother is, because I don't care. I want to know who Cla- I, I almost called her Claire. I want to know who Ruby is. I don't care who her mother is. Maybe her mother's a leaf and she's Claire's sister. That's it's always a possibility. But no, I can't get invested in who her mother is. That's I don't think that's a way to introduce a character. I want to know about her. And it's interesting. See, I guess we'll see the drama in a band. She was in that band, right? Yeah, she was definitely on stage. Maybe they just bring up a random keyboardist. I forget what she was doing. Oh, she might that. have been doing the keyboard. I don't remember what she was doing. And they don't like the point. We didn't get like any... Like we saw her hang out with someone from France, but we didn't see much of interaction or like why the France... We just, we just don't know much about her. I, mean, like, I didn't mind that so much. I, kind of, I was kind of nice to see her just hanging out with her friends. I, I wish she had maybe had one more scene of it. But I guess with this story, they're trying to tell they... They didn't want to like they did a bother job. I forget. I, I forget the. I, I, I don't even have it written down. But her adopted mother. They did a bother job of flashing out her character than they did Ruby. Yeah, I feel like that's true. Although it does help when they have that scene where she disappears from the timeline for a bit, and we see what her life would have been like without Ruby. Maybe a scene like that in reverse. I don't know. I guess I don't know how that would work, but. Yeah, I, I, don't, I look forward to learning more about her in future episodes. And it's kind of annoying because this is our first look at Ruby and more of an extended look at this doctor. And I don't think, I guess we know it's going to be what? They said Easter 2024. So you're going to have to wait five months. And this is, or four months. And this is the only thing we really know right now. And so I think the problem is that a lot of people are going to kind of cement their opinions on oh, she doesn't have character, she's just like Clara. And then even once she starts getting character, that's still going to be prevalent in the community, among the people who believe that anyway, which would be a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most people agree. Or I, I did see too many people criticizing Gawa's performance. I think he makes for, and we saw this at the end of the gig or two, he seems like he's going to be a really fun doctor. Hopefully the story is uh, written maybe a bit more stably. It, 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 I think it's also fair to say, so Mr. Mateo doesn't necessarily feel like classic Russell T. Davis tough, but... No, but a... I, I always thought it was a bit of a... I never believed that once Russell T. Davis came back, I was going to feel exactly like he never left. Right? This change and times change. I, I don't mean that's a criticism, it's just that people might go in expecting, I don't know, a season five if Moffat never came on. And obviously, that would be somewhat foolish of you to expect but uh, yeah i'm hoping the writing stabilizes a bit there was like a, a trailer released of this upcoming season it's just like i don't know 25 30 seconds and showing random scenes i saw the beaters in one of them which is exciting but I, i'm hoping that we have some decent decently written stories some more character exploration of who ruby actually is and Maybe they just never mentioned Ruby's parents again. Like James said, they sort of start up in this episode. Apparently, it's going to be important who the mother is. I, I don't possibly see how, and I don't possibly care that much. It just, and I don't want it to. Yeah, and I, I, I saw someone say on Twitter that there's a, I, I, and I forget the details, but the idea was that they're sort of sick of all this like big mystery stuff, like season-long mystery arcs. For instance, like 
Duct to tape. Fair, not, to, to be fair, that's how Rashidi Davis did, though. No, I, I, I get it, but it seems like most seasons have the issue. Like the whole Doctor Who thing. To be honest, I, I, I still have issues with a lot of Moffat stuff, and God knows I'm not the only one. But I, I just sort of wish we could have simpler times, like a uh, Chibnall series one. Uh, oh. Don't hey, say that, please. Hey, the the idea though to move away from traditional villains and focus on standalone stories. I think the idea had merit. It's just the execution. Well, you, well, you saw where that went, but yeah, no, that's true. The idea is fine because I don't mind serialization. I actually quite like the classic series how they handled it. Maybe there's some padding. Well, there was padding, but on the whole, I thought there was let the story breathe. Now you have to fit in introducing the plot, introducing the politics, introducing the characters in 10 minutes before you get to the story. And then it's going to wrap up in 30 more minutes. And that's really how to do. So it's a whole different type of writing compared to the classic series. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't mind the mystery, mysteries lasting throughout the season. I just want them to be part of the mysteries. For example, the mystery of season four with all oh, the abuse of disappearing. Oh, I've now on the planet gets mentioned that's missing. Like that was that was I think I th- I don't think it's really disputed. Yeah. I think that's the best mystery for a I, season. I mean I actually think that felt more organic. It sort of just came up in passing. Whereas this I, I forget what the piece of dialogue was, but it made it sound like, oh hey, this is going to be the important thing. Who is the mother? And it just feels sort of forced. Yeah, I don't know. Unless the mother's a vast reform. I don't really care who it is. But Patrick, she is. Oh, well, that's different. But yeah, I look forward to learning more about Ruby. And once I learn more about Ruby, then I'll start caring about her relatives. One other thing that's worth mentioning, and this is, I think, one of the big conversation pieces. I, f- I forget if it's exactly next door, but close to Ruby's apartment, or, or, it's not even her flat, it's her uh, adopted mother's flat, but... Close to her flat, this is woman, an older woman, middle-aged woman, named Mrs. Flood. She appeared a few times in the episode. She's just like a, a small character who didn't really amount too much. Then at the end, she seemed to sort of coax the doctor into staying. It seemed like the doctor was thinking about leaving without inviting Ruby to travel with him. Because well, I imagine he thought, hey, I have other people I've... Love to live in the final second of the life. Yeah, for some reason, for, for, yeah, for some reason, a pub is all played in front of his eyes. <laughs> so, so I, I can understand. I'm having second Ruby thoughts. Ruby was cured by a board. <laughs> uh, some fun times. I'm hoping he comes back too. But, um, I'll make it with the board. Both, in before the <laughs> raven returns. Mrs. Flood is the raven, but you want the force, guys. Well, the sad thing is, maybe people have. <laughs> Oh, that's even worse. But not to get too detailed, but naturally Ruby does decide to go travel with the doctor. This is a fun scene where, well, the scene's always fun where the companion sees a towel. This towel is just looking quite nice. The doctor's just standing like, yeah, bro, it's, it's nice. It's big, isn't it? Then the towel just disappears and this other person is speaking to Flo, like, hey, do you see that? And I forget what she says. Like, oh, it's nothing to worry about. Then she looks straight at the camera and says, what, you haven't seen a tower this before? And, and then she winks. Well, yeah, and that gets, oh, as, as you can imagine, the fan base explodes. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, because when you see her earlier in the episode, she's just complaining about this. It was pretty amusing, actually. She's complaining about somebody, well, the doctor had parked the tower just right in the middle of the sidewalk. And she's complaining that, oh, it was the next door neighbor who planted it to this tall poor joke. <laughs> Which is kind of funny. But then at the end, she has that line, and it's, I don't hate it as much as I hated it when I first saw it. Because when I first saw that, what I thought was, oh, this is going to be just a joke for the audience. It's just going to be another Feast for Steven thing. With well, a doctor. I mean, for, for all we, I don't mean whatever, but maybe it is. I don't think we know yet. Unless, like, somebody said, hey, that's going to be important later. And maybe someone has said that. I'm not sure. But for all we know right now, at least for all I know, it could just be like a, a joke to the audience. And if it is, then it loses, for me, it loses the episode two points. I just, I personally do not like, I don't know if you can call that matter. I don't know if, I don't like breaking the fourth wall. 
I've never really liked that in media, and I know there's a very intelligent way to do it with very thoughtful storytelling. Some writers can do that very well. It happens a lot now in comic books. There are some writers who are doing that a lot, but they're doing it in very constructive ways. But I don't really like it in TV shows, and I certainly don't like it at the end of an episode like this, where I already felt a bit like how they do. It's a strange to say in an episode where there was this whole group of people planning to eat a baby, but or feed it to the king. I mean, even worse, monarchy. But I don't know. I did like the wink, but if this woman actually shows up later in the series, which is very likely, this is Roger T. Davis, we're probably going to see her stepmother, and there's also the grandmother. We're probably going to see those pretty regularly throughout the upcoming series. Well, I mean, it's only eight episodes. But we'll probably still see them. I would say in about three of them. We'll probably see them. Because Russell Davis likes the family element. Because that's he played around with it a lot. With Jackie. With Martha's family, which was a complete mess. With, of course, Donna. With her mother and Wilf. So he really likes doing these family dramas in mixed in with his Doctor Who, which is completely fine with me. I quite like it. I think it humanizes the companions a lot. Imagine if we had seen Mao's mother, for example. But if this was just a Christmas joke, I don't like it. And as it is, even if this character is one of the names you've been thrown around, I, even if that's the case, no matter who it is, to me, it still doesn't justify the wink. For me, that's just not going to be fixed. But everything else aside, there have been a lot of interesting conversations about who this character might or might not be. Yeah, I think that's the thing, one of the single biggest conversation or pieces of discourses I've seen after the episode came out. Like, yeah, I mean, all there is is that and who or why about the importance of Ruby's mother. The funny thing is, I, now, like I said, I don't delve deep into the internet who community. I just haven't seen that much conversation about it because I don't think like it seems to me people are far far more interested in who the hell Flad is as opposed to well I think, more, I think it's a more interesting question anyway but yeah and, and I mean and there's been a ton of suggestions thrown out obviously you have the people you sort of expect like some people think it's the master which I think's uh, why the uh, why just why I mean, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be horrible if it was the master and, yeah I, I mean and you see all types of suggestions one that's not uncommon is the Rani who, if you don't know the Rani, the classic... Well, we talked about the Rani a lot in our giggle. Yeah, the, episode, yeah the giggle, but yeah, appeared twice in the classic series and has it reappeared, and people always hope that she comes back. I have to imagine, like I said, I have it right deep, but there's so many suggestions. I'm not sure if you want to touch more on that. One of my favorite suggestions is the idea that it's the time madly, a female incarnation of the time madly. Of course, we first see the time madly way back when, Again, actually, in the first Doctor thing, much like the Toy Maker, but this one even predates the Toy Maker because this was, I believe, Toy 17. And the Time Adler was a Time Lord from the Doctor's Planet who had the TARDIS. But this was before we knew the name Time Lord. It was before we knew what planet they were from. This is way back when some of the earliest stuff we get about the Doctor dealing with another one of his own species. And the time model was just this guy who liked messing with history. I think his plan was to make it so I do not know UK history, so you're going to have to forgive me. Something about the Normandy invasion or something like that. Point is, he wanted it to change it so there was no United Kingdom and that they lost all those years ago and so that the United Kingdom would never form as it is today. And not for any malicious reasons, he just thought it would be fun for my recollection. I, I think the time model is actually a pretty good for Stack Destroy. I've only seen it once, but I remember quite liking it. But the idea just that maybe this woman's the time modeler, and I don't remember the evidence that the person gave. I've seen it from a couple of people. But I just think, oh, that would be interesting. It fits with it reintroducing the toy maker after all this time. Why not introduce a female incarnation of the time modeler? It's possibly when I'm pretty sure, and I might be wrong about this, but I've seen it mentioned that the Time Madly has a female incarnation on Big Finish at some point, which makes sense. Again, it's a Time Lord. They can have a female incarnation. Isn't that strange or unnatural if that's the case? But I don't know. I just thought that's... To me, that's the most interesting and intriguing one. 
I don't really, as much as I want to see the Rani come back to this character, did it feel like I like the Rani? Because the Rani, the last character's changed a lot. That's it, gave a damn about the doctor. She just doesn't care. So I'm not sure why she would try to urge the doctor to take Ruby on as a companion. And she did it said in so many words in this episode. But that's basically what Mrs. Flat was saying to the doctor. And of course, as Michael said, it being the master would be horrendous. I don't think Rachel Davis would do that. But I don't know. I think it's going to be quite interesting to see this play out, if indeed there is a mystery that will play out. Yeah, and I have not, naturally, I have no idea who it's going to be. I, I don't, I'm not sure. But it's interesting. And yeah, that's, that's good stuff. So final thoughts for me on this episode, really. It's never going to be one I go back to all the time. I think it'll be a very strange episode as a first introduction to the Doctor for any New Who fans. And I don't mean New Who as in 2005. I mean New Doctor Who fans in 2023. But I can understand if it is somebody's first episode and they feel automatically attached to this type of energy the Doctor exudes. I mean, that's perfectly fine. It's just not going to be one of my favorite introductions to a Doctor. I think the 11th hour, if you have to compare the two complete choices in almost everything, if not just everything. But nonetheless, I don't dislike it as much as I did the first time. Now you could say I'm probably slightly positive towards it, but not terribly high. Like I said, I'd probably give it a 6 out of 10 if I had to rate it that way. But yeah, I thought it was okay. I thought there were some interesting ideas in it. As Mago said, I'm not sure I quite understand the whole thing with coincidences either. The goblins kind of time wove into people's history to kind of salt the meat. It means interesting, but I don't know. And actually, no, the thing about it, they remind me of Pennywise, only in a different way. I still want my Doctor Who it crash over, but that's going to happen. Um, it's an okay episode, maybe not the best introduction, but I do look, quite look forward to how this next series is going to play out. And the Doctor... If nothing else, the doctor in this episode was really good. And I did quite like his performance here. Yeah, I, I think the the really big takeaway from this is that Gatwa should be a really fun and fascinating doctor to watch. I want Ruby to have some more character and hopefully we get in the next couple episodes. Just to sort of solidify the relationship. Because I thought Ruby got along with the doctor pretty well. But I still want to know more about Ruby as a person. You know, I got... I don't know if it's just me, but there were some moments in the episode where Ruby was looking at the Doctor as though she was interested in him romantically. And I really hope they don't go that route again. There's Rasha T. Davies, so maybe she'll be the new Rose. I really hope not, though. Yeah, I, that would also be disappointing because they're going to bring back Rose, too. Speaking of which, Mrs. Flat is perhaps Rose from the alternate dimension growing up. Be rather. Well, and and then she, and Rose then she and the can, Raven. Yeah, and then she can, and she's here to collect the other David Tannett. There you are. See, it's, it's, it's all coming together. But, yeah, I don't know. The Trots on Ruby Road, which I think is a, a nice name. It's, it's a great a, name. Yeah, it's a good title. I think it's a decent episode. It's not great, but for like some lighthearted Christmas fun, it's not bad. Hopefully, you'll see this next season do some good things. I don't know. It's one of the things where. Again, I don't know if it's really going to be indicative of what the rest of Gatwa's time is going to be like. I don't think Gatwa's going to sing each episode. Though, honestly, I'll be okay with it. If they can make it work in the... I mean, if he's going to appear with the Beatles, I don't see why it doesn't help them out with a song or two. Maybe he's Matt Smith. Oh, I play the triangle here. I kind of got... Oh, I forget how you phrase it. <laughs> but it was, it was hilarious at the time. Yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, naturally... As always, you can let us know what you thought about this one. Either comment here or leave a message on Twitter. I mean, I think a lot of the recent episodes have been more divisive, which is a good thing because at least they're not like at least they're not like hated. At least some people are getting more from it than others. But it seems like a, a more divisive puzzle. But let us know what you thought. Let us know what you think about Gatwa's performance and looking forward to our guys what this doctor's going to be like. And relatedly, we do have a Twitter at Brothers Mahoney. Should you be interested? Just hashtag follow, bruh. And by Twitter, I mean Axel. Whatever they might call it when this it's comes out. It's called Twitter. Boy, yeah, Elon Musk would be happy with you, bruh. No, I don't give a damn about you. No, I'm sorry. The website, you are always still called Twitter. And every single news article that Manson said, calls it Axe, formerly known as Twitter. In which case, there is no point in calling it Axe if you're just going to call it Twitter anyway. It's Twitter. 
Hashtag fuck Elon. Oh, snap. It's getting real up in this. But yeah, we're going to get more real to talk about the Palestinians. But oh, snap. That's that's next episode. But <laughs> yeah, the, the doctor is going to give an anti war speech and telling Hamas that they sort of fight. Yeah, no, he, he's, 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 um, it's, it's going to be him. It's going to be complete whiplash. He and Ruby are going to end up in Gaza. They're going and, to join the IDF. Well, see, the doctor is with the Palestinians, but Ruby's with the Israelis. And it's, it's going to be some. <laughs> It's going to go to some classic who routes and they're also going to throw in Davos. But a- 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 anyhow, they're probably not going to do that. That might be a bit much for them. But Davros, he- by the way. Yeah, that's okay. I- it's it's all in good fun. But yeah, let us know what you thought. But as always, uh, this has been the Brass Mahoney. I'm Michael. And I'm James. And we hope that you have a happy new year. Ha- well, indeed. Ha- well, I mean, I mean it'll, be the, it'll, it'll be the new year by the time this comes up, but we are recording on the 34th. Yeah, 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 that's a far note. This uh, episode came out the 25th. We are recording on the 34th because you roll. In the, anyhow, you guys have a nice one. See you in 2024. Well, we will see you, but. Yeah, we, we, we will deadly deep you in Easter. <laughs>